Hey folks, welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense ongoing coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Today was the fifth day of the trial by which Assistant DA Thomas Bingers, seeking to have Kyle Rittenhouse convicted and sentenced to life in prison, plus five years, for having shot three men too fatally the night of August 25th, 2020 in Kenosha, Wisconsin, when the city was suffering a tsunami of rioting, looting, and arson following the lawful shooting of knife-wielding Jacob Blake by Kenosha police officers. And it would be hard to fully express what a utter catastrophe this day was for Prosecutor Binger. The prosecution's demise came into the courtroom in the form of its star witness, Gage Grosskreutz, famously shot in the right bicep by Kyle Rittenhouse as Grosskreutz closed Glock in hand on the fallen but not defeated 17-year-old. Grosskreutz is the only survivor from among the three men who were struck by Kyle's desperately fired rounds and the only one of Kyle's attackers available to testify for the state in this prosecution. The fourth primary attacker, known only as Jump Kick Man, had the unbelievably good fortune to be missed twice by the 17-year-old and has since prudently disappeared off the face of the earth. Grosskreutz is fortunate that modern American courtrooms do not allow trial by combat because otherwise he'd have been carried out of the courtroom today, mortally wounded by his own testimony. Perhaps guessing how poorly today's Grosskreutz testimony would go for him today, Assistant DA Binger did come to court with a trick up his purple sleeve, the sudden discovery just this past Friday of quote-unquote high-definition drone footage that he and his crack investigative team present as putting the final nail in the coffin of Kyle's claims of self-defense in his shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum. To that, my lawyer's magic eight ball and my own eyes on that video says, yeah, not so much. And again, I've seen the purported video and you will too. It's embedded along with a lot of other video clips in today's content. In fact, today's content will be very light on written legal analysis and very heavy on short, focused, embedded video segments from the cross-examination of Gage Grosskreutz, because that's where the gold is today. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Before we dive in, I do want to mention our sponsor, CCW Safe, a provider of legal service memberships that many people mistakenly call self-defense insurance. I've looked at all the companies that offer this kind of service, as you might imagine, and I found that CCW Safe is by far the best fit for me. Whether they're the best fit for you is something only you can decide, but I do urge you to take a look at what they have to offer by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. And if you do decide to become a member with them, you can save 10% off your membership using the discount code LOSD10. That's LOSD for Law of Self-Defense and the number 10 at that URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. First, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus here just on the testimony provided by Grosskreutz on cross-examination, because again, that's where the meat is here. Indeed, much of the cloying direct questioning by Assistant DA Binger sounded more like the kind of conversation one might overhear of two people on their first date at a coffee shop, rather than the direct examination of a prosecutor seeking to prove a homicide case beyond a reasonable doubt. As I stepped through the cross-examination of Grosskreutz today, I identified no fewer than 19 substantive portions, nearly 50% of the total time spent on cross by defense attorney Tarafasi that were substantively destructive to the state's narrative of guilt and helpful to the defense narrative of self-defense. And that's not how the state's star witness is supposed to work out. Frankly, it was harder to identify the parts to leave out of today's end-of-day post than it was to select the parts to keep in. It was, in short, a veritable legal bloodbath. By far the most destructive of Grosskreutz's testimony to the state narrative of guilt was when he recounted before the jury that at the moment that he was shot in the bicep by Kyle, the moment that his bicep was vaporized, to use his own language, his own Glock 27 40 caliber pistol with a round in the chamber was pointed directly at Kyle from a distance of perhaps three feet. All this while he insisted on direct examination that he would never be able to shoot another human being because that's not the kind of person I am. Here's a clip of that portion of the cross-examination. You would agree at this point 
you are dropping your hands, you are loading your front foot, and you are moving toward Mr. Rittenhouse at that point. True? Yes. Okay. So, we're shot. Can you bring up the photo? You'd agree. And now wait, how close do you think you are to him at that point? Three feet. Okay. If it was five feet before, it would. So. So tell me if I've got the lay of the land. <laughs> At this point, you're holding a loaded chambered Glock 27 in your right hand. Yes. That is correct. Yes. You are advancing on Mr. Rittenhouse, who is seated on his butt. Right. That is correct. You're moving forward, and your right hand drops down with your gun. Your hands are no longer up, and now they're, the gun is pointed in the direction of Mr. Rittenhouse. Agree? I'll give you a, a picture. Maybe that'll help. So, um, Mr. Grosskirtz, I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 67. Uh, that's a photo of you, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, that's Mr. Rittenhouse? Correct. Okay. Now, you degree your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? Yes. Okay. And once your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, that's when he fires his gun. Yes? No. <laughs> Sir, look, I don't want to... Does this look like right now your arm is being shot? That looks like my bicep being vaporized, yes. Okay. And it's being vaporized as you're pointing your gun directly at him. Yes? Yes. Okay, so when you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired, right? Correct. Almost as compelling was Gage Grosskreutz, I remind you, the state's star witness, testifying repeatedly how Rittenhouse had only ever shot at people who were actually attacking him and never fired a shot at anybody who was not, or even anybody who appeared to have begun an attack and then backed off. Here Grosskreutz recounted how Kyle had the opportunity to shoot him as he rushed up, gun in hand, but did not fire when Grosskreutz put the brakes on his rush and put his hands up in the universal gesture of unthreatening. We just heard a shot, yes? Correct. Okay. And to be fair, that you put on the brakes, right? You were running, you then almost stop in your tracks. Fair enough? Correct. Okay. And I don't know if your arms are up at that point, but it looks like you're kind of protecting your head at that point. Is that fair? That is correct. Okay. How far do you think you are away from him at that point to the best of your ability? I would say about there uh, between... Um, Me and you? You and I, correct. So three feet? Three to five. Okay. Now at that point... You have your hands up, right? Yes, I do. Now, you probably don't notice him at the time. This guy's holding up what looks like a wooden club of some type. Some sort of wooden object, yes. Okay. So your hands are up, and at that point, he has not fired at you, correct? No, he has not. Okay. Here's Grosskreutz testifying that it was not just himself who Kyle declined to shoot when he appeared to stop a rushing attack. There were other people who also rushed to Kyle, then put on the brakes, and had Kyle pass on the easy opportunity to shoot them. Now, you see that? This isn't you, but you see this gentleman right here? Uh, I, see I do. Okay. He's, would you like Sister Marcian's pointer? Oh, sure. It's up to you. I don't... You, you're... Welcome to use your glasses if you want. He's got it. Oh, he's got it. See this gentleman right here, right? I do. Okay. Now, you agree he advanced on what ran after came up to Mr. Rittenhouse, right? 
Can you rewind just slightly? Can you just go, you know, go back ten? You agree that he runs up to Mr. Rittenhouse and then applies the brakes, right? I do. Okay. And you'd agree that he's feet, me to you away. And that's a okay. fair assessment, yes. Two, three feet. He's advancing on Mr. Rittenhouse, and you'd agree. He puts his hands up, and Mr. Rittenhouse never fires his gun. Correct? That is correct. Perhaps as sweet as Grosskreutz's testimony about how disciplined Kyle was in his judicious use of deadly defensive force only against people apparently attempting to kill or maim him, was Grosskreutz's testimony about his own tender concerns for Kyle's well-being while being attacked by multi-deadly force aggressors, including himself. Here's Grosskreutz testifying that, in his opinion, Kyle was in genuine physical danger, a danger about which he, Grosskreutz, himself was concerned. Well, you, how far away from this when it's going on are you? I don't recall how far away I was exactly when this uh, action occurred. You're a matter of feet, right? I think that's a fair thing to say. Uh, okay. Close. All right, and you, you're seeing this. So you are having some concern, maybe as a medic or your all your training, uh, that Kyle Rittenhouse is in physical danger. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So, and you believe he's in physical danger because he's being attacked, right? That's fair. That's a fair thing to say, yes. Here's Grosskreutz testifying that he was particularly concerned that Kyle might suffer some serious head trauma under the tender mercies of Anthony Huber's skateboard. In the same day that Assistant DA Binger sought to ridicule the notion that a skateboard could present as a deadly force threat. In fact, Grosskreutz was on record as having told police that he was particularly concerned about the manner in which Anthony Huber was swinging the skateboard with a grip on the trucks, the metal fixtures that attached the wheels to the board, and which provide for the board to be struck with exceptional force. Then... You know that's, you didn't know it then, but you know now that's Anthony Huber, right? Correct. Okay. And you see, you saw this happening, right? Correct. And it was no more from me to you away probably at that point, true? I don't recall, but it's probably fair. Yes. And in fact, you had mentioned to the officers that you even recalled Mr. Huber holding onto the trucks of that skateboard when he was striking him, right? Correct. And that, to be fair, as a medic, that concerned you, did it not? I think any time that there is a, a risk of head trauma, that it's a risk. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, you believe in this picture, one of the reasons you wanted to intervene was you believe that Mr. Rittenhouse was in danger of being seriously hurt, right? In part, yes. Indeed, so concerned was Grosskreutz by the danger of Huber's skateboard attack that he repeatedly shouted at Huber to stop hitting Kyle with the board. Yes, that's his own testimony under cross-examination today. And you had mentioned to the police that evening that you tried telling Mr. Huber, you just said the guy, but you tried telling the guy to stop hitting him with the skateboard. Is that right? That is what I put in my statement, yes. Is that true? With the benefit of hindsight, I don't believe that to be true, no. Okay, so when you told that to the police that you told the guy with the skateboard to stop hitting him, that, that was, that's not correct, that's not true. That is correct. <clears throat> And it wasn't just Huber whom Gross Kreutz described as attacking Kyle with deadly force, meaning, legally, force capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. Although Gross Kreutz burned much of what little he credibility he might have had by pretending that jump kick man was not kicking work boots into Kyle's face, he was ultimately compelled to concede the truth of that attack. Okay. But you acknowledge you here, get him and get his ass. Correct, I do. Okay. So... Fair at that point, you believe these people are, those people are chasing him down. Yes, I do. And the, I'm going to use the word mob, you use whatever word you want. It's getting bigger as they're running, isn't it? 
more people are joining this. I think that's a fair thing to say. And you believe, well, tell me if this is true. You were concerned for Kyle Rittenhouse's safety. Yes, I was. You were concerned because you saw, and I'm going to refer to him as the only way we refer to him, jump kick man. So you see this guy kick him in the face. Drew? I do not see jump kick man kick him in the face. You see him attempt to kick him in the face? From my perspective, I didn't see any specific motion regarding kicking. Um, but it is fair to say that I, I did observe jump kick man going over the defendant. Okay. And he's going, if you remember, he's going over the defendant with his foot in the air, correct? I don't recall that. You have a picture of <laughs> And before I bring it up, to be fair, you're making up ground on Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? As you're running in his direction. Correct. Correct. Okay. You had, you eventually catch him. Correct. Come up to him, right? Correct. Okay. You see that going on, correct? Correct. Okay. So, if we're being honest with one another, he appears to me to try to kick him in the face, right? In this photograph, yes. Okay. Perhaps as helpful to the defense, Grosskreutz was compelled under cross-examination to concede that in every one of his own interactions with Rittenhouse, until, of course, his attack on the fallen 17-year-old with the Glock pistol, that Kyle was far from volatile or provocative, but was instead non-confrontational and simply seeking to help people. And this was true even when it was Grosskreutz himself acting in a provocative manner towards Kyle. One Mr. Banger said, what do you bring? And you said, keys, wallet, whatever else, and a gun, right? I didn't say that, yeah. Kind of standard operating procedure for you out in the summer of 2020? Uh, not just the summer of 2020. Oh, so you had carried your firearm at times previous to that? That's correct. And you're doing that for personal protection, correct? Correct. And you're carrying it concealed, are you not? That is correct. It's unlawful for you to carry it concealed. Is that not true? Unlawful? Yeah, you can't carry a concealed weapon without a, a CCW permit, right? That is correct, yes. You have to open carry. You have to have, we're talking about people with their guns out. You have to carry it with it out if you don't have a CCW permit, right? That is correct. And you didn't have a CCW permit, did you? I did have a CCW permit. It wasn't valid, correct? After the fact, yes, I found out that it was not valid. As for the notion pushed by Assistant DA Binger that the men attacking 17-year-old Kyle did so in the belief that he was an active shooter, purportedly, Grosskreutz put a stake in the heart of that nonsensical narrative when he conceded that even he, the only identified of the attackers on Kyle who could have been so motivated, lacked any reasonable basis on which to come to a conclusion of active shooter. As I noted in my most recent post examining the issues of provocation in this case, a belief that Kyle was an active shooter in the absence of evidence consistent with such a perception can only be an irrational, speculative, and imaginative belief. And an irrational, speculative, and imaginative belief of an attacker cannot in any way diminish a defender's privilege of self-defense. To allow this would be to make every claim of self-defense contingent on the irrational, speculative, and imaginative beliefs of the attacker. And that's not how self-defense law in particular, nor the law in general, works. In the context of an active shooter perception, for that perception to be reasonable and not merely speculative, at a minimum, there must be evidence of the core characteristic of an active shooter as an aggressor who has or is attempting to shoot multiple people. Engage Grosskreutz naturally had zero evidence that Kyle had engaged in any such activity. Tell me if this is fair. And I'm not, Mr. Bringer's asked uh, witnesses to do this, so I'm going to ask you to do the same. You've probably watched videos, you've probably seen all this. I'm asking you to put yourself back there at that time, okay? You know shots are fired. Right? Correct. Okay. 
And the only information that you have is Mr. Rittenhouse saying, according to you, he pulled the gun on me first. Right? Correct. And based on that, you believe there's an active shooter. Not solely on that, but yes. You don't have any information, correct? I had minimal information. And in fact, what he says to you was, I'm going to the police, correct? That is correct. And he's running toward the police, isn't he? That is correct. Okay. So what you, and tell me if this is right. You have no idea what happened with Mr. Rosenbaum, do you? I, apart from, no. Uh, just, no. On that day. Correct. Okay. One particularly ironic aspect of Grosskreutz's cross-examination was when it was revealed that while Kyle is looking at a life sentence in prison, plus five years if he's convicted on his own unlawful gun possession charge, it turns out that Grosskreutz himself was unlawfully in possession of the Glock pistol with which he attempted to kill Kyle. While Kyle was carrying his AR rifle openly, an open carry requires no license from the state of Wisconsin, Grosskreutz was carrying his pistol concealed. And concealed carry does require a license from the state of Wisconsin. And Grosskreutz did not have a valid concealed carry permit. True, he had an invalid permit. But there's a reason the law distinguishes between valid and invalid permits. The former has legal effect and the latter does not. One Mr. Banger said, what do you bring? And you said, keys, wallet, whatever else, and a gun, right? I didn't say that, yeah. Kind of standard operating procedure for you out in the summer of 2020? Uh, not just the summer of 2020. Oh, so you had carried your firearm at times previous to that? That's correct. And... You're doing that for personal protection, correct? Correct. And you're carrying it concealed, are you not? That is correct. It's unlawful for you to carry it concealed. Is that not true? Unlawful? Yeah, you can't carry a concealed weapon without a, a CCW permit, right? That is correct, yes. You have to open carry. You have to have, you've been talking about people with their guns out. You have to carry it with it out if you don't have a CCW permit, right? That is correct. And you didn't have a CCW permit, did you? I did have a CCW permit. It wasn't valid, correct? After the fact, yes, I found out that it was not valid. So have you been charged for unlawfully carrying a firearm? No, I have not. For much of the rest of his testimony, under cross-examination, Grosskreutz simply presented as, frankly, a bald-faced liar. For example, despite the voluminous video evidence of Grosskreutz chasing down a fleeing Kyle Rittenhouse, video that was repeatedly shown to the jury during cross-examination today, Grosskreutz repeatedly lied and said he wasn't chasing Kyle. I mean, who are we supposed to believe? The felon who tried to gun down a fallen 17-year-old in the street or our own lying eyes? Here's the first instance of the I wasn't chasing nobody, officer, lie. You didn't drop your firearm. You were chasing Mr. Rittenhouse with your gun, right? You yes. Are... You were chasing him with your gun, yes? No. You didn't chase him down Sheridan Road, pulling your gun, chasing after him. That's a lie. You're saying that didn't happen. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I wasn't chasing the defendant. You were running after him? No. No. And again, he's running away from you, right? He's running north on Sheridan Road. Yes? Correct. And he's running away from where you're standing. True? Correct. You, at that point, pull a firearm out from your belt and begin to chase him. True? That is not true. And again. So... He's 30 feet, at least 30 feet ahead of you. You look like at that point you're moving. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So with him 30 feet ahead of you, running away from you, at that point you pull your firearm and begin to chase him, correct? No. You don't begin to chase him? Nope. No, I do not. You head in the direction that he's running. Yes? Correct. 
But you just happen to be running in that direction? It has nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse running in that direction? No, it does have to do with the defendant running in that direction, yes. Okay, so you are trying to chase him down? No. Grosskreutz's blatant lying, at least by omission in this instance, also came up when Karofasi repeatedly exposed his failure to disclose to anyone at the time, or even in his currently pending lawsuits in state and federal court, that he was armed when he was shot by Kyle. Instead, he either completely forgets to mention that he was pointing a gun at Kyle when he was shot in the bicep, or he completely fabricates a fairy tale about his gun having fallen out of his holster while he was not chasing Kyle down Sheridan Street, as here. It goes on a narrative version of your (laughs) statement. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And if I could, toward the end of that, large paragraph. You'd agree it says, sometime during the incident, my Gen 4 Glock 27 that had a belt clip attached fell off my waist. Correct? Correct. Okay. That's a lie, right? I wouldn't say that's a lie, no. You didn't take the Glock out of your back here and run with it? I did. So it didn't fall off your waist. It was in your hand. That's correct. So you would say that's not a lie? No, I would say it isn't. Okay, and you told that to multiple officers. Isn't that true? I don't know. Same exhibit, sir. The next sentence. I told multiple officers that I dropped my firearm. Right? Correct. Okay. And also here. This is a notice of claim. Is that right? That is correct. Filed on your behalf by your lawyer, right? That is correct, yes. Making a notice or telling, among others, the city and county of Kenosha that you would like $10 million. True? That is correct. Did you read this? I did. So are you aware document. You never mentioned that you actually possessed a firearm. You know that? That is correct. You left that part out, right? That is correct. Grosskreutz was also rather awkwardly caught lying about his relationship with his favorite revolution political group, claiming he didn't have any association with them, except for having spoken at their rally, having shouted, long live the revolution with a fist salute while doing that, and having members of the organization actually occupying several of the hard-to-get seats in the courtroom during his testimony. I guess they just randomly wandered in. Now, you had talked about your purpose of being there that evening. You're a member of our Wisconsin Revolution, are you not? No, I'm not. You're a member of the People's Revolution? No, I'm not. Have you spoken at their rallies? I have at one. And during that rally... uh, Have you made statements such as, long live the revolution? I have. And you have no affiliation with them, though? Affiliation, yes. Okay, there's some of those people in the crowd today, aren't there? Yes. Another sign of Grosskreutz's remarkable lack of prudence was exposed when Trophacy pulled up a tweet by the witness made in anticipation of his upcoming testimony in which he festooned the tweet with a winky emoji face, a tweet he sent just this past Friday, knowing that he would be testifying on Monday. Good show to the defense for catching it. Now you had mentioned that you believe that he was re-racking, I, think you, I don't know much about guns, but you had mentioned that you believed he was re-racking his gun or something, right? That is correct, yes. Now, this is your, I mean, this is right, this is your tweet from November 5th. So, during this trial, you're tweeting out, yes? Yes. And you tweet out to whoever these people are, make sure you look and listen for the defendant's firearm malfunction, and then you have a, a winky emoji face. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay. So... This is, the 5th was yesterday? That would have been Friday. Friday. Time's flanged. Um, So Friday at 7.45, 
You and what's the winky emoji? I believe that was in response to uh, whoever the original um, whoever the original poster is uh, on there. Uh, I don't know what the original post was, but it was more than likely in response to uh, this person's opinion that they had posted. Now, as entertaining as the gross crude's cross-examination was to watch, and it was, another highlight of the day was Assistant DA Binger's triumphant presentation of his suddenly discovered unicorn evidence that I suppose is intended to put the final nail in the coffin of Kyle's self-defense narrative. This unicorn evidence comes in the form of drone footage, not the FBI aerial footage we've already seen, but footage from a consumer-level drone, like a DJI Mavic 2 Pro, for example. This amazing video footage purportedly appeared on the prosecutor's doorstep just this past Friday morning, left, I suppose, by the evidence fairy. Footage from the drone was shown in Binger's direct examination of Detective Anta Ramian, who has been sitting at the prosecution table for much of this trial and who was purportedly an independent lead investigator in this case. Another lead detective on this case, by the way, who had less than two years in that position when assigned. Although Binger introduced the footage in his direct of Antaramium, he didn't ask anything substantive about it until he had the detective on redirect. At that point, he asked the detective to share with the court his perception of what the video showed. And a more hesitant and ambiguous and tentative testimony is hard to imagine. The detective cautioned that he'd only looked at the video a little over the weekend and he'd only had his relatively low-resolution smartphone to view the video on, but if he simply had to share an opinion on what the video showed, he believed it showed Kyle Rittenhouse raising his rifle in the direction of the Zeminskis when he passed the group of cars containing Rosenbaum. Further, at the moment that Kyle shot the charging Rosenbaum, he said, the detective claimed, he saw that Rosenbaum was no closer than three feet and certainly not sufficiently close to touch Kyle's rifle. On recross examination, Tarafasi expressed some incredulity that the detective could make out such detail in the drone video from what he himself had seen of it. The detective explained that on his phone, he had the ability to zoom in and, and that's what yielded the necessary detail. Well, folks, I also have the ability to zoom in and I do it not on a smartphone, but on a giant 4K iMac computer monitor. And when I zoom in to the scene that captures Kyle going past the Zeminskis, I see nothing whatever that looks like anyone pointing a rifle in the direction of anyone else. What I see is a bunch of pixel soup. Further, on recross, Jurafasi had the detective concede that there was evidence of powder stippling on Rosenbaum's body at autopsy. Such stippling is essentially gunpowder flakes embedded in the skin and occurs when the person exposed to the shot is quite close to the muzzle. Of course, Rosenbaum was not standing still out of arm's reach. He was charging at Kyle at full speed. If he happened to not quite be in arm's reach at the moment, he certainly would have been in the next tenth of a second. So here's a mashup of Binger first showing the drone video on direct and then asking for Detective Anter Ramian's interpretation of the video on redirect. Before we uh, begin that video, Detective at... Uh at some point in the investigation, did you become aware of the fact that there was drone video that someone had recorded? If you know. Yeah, early on, I don't know the exact date, but early on we did see on a, a news segment, I believe it was a Fox News segment, uh, that there was drone footage that we hadn't found at that point in time. Do you have any idea where the, what the source of that drone footage was? I believe it was accredited to Urban Aired. Um, I have on the screen a uh, video which has been marked as exhibit number 73. Is this that footage that you're referring to? It appears so. Okay. Can we please play that for the jury?
Detective, um, just to help everybody understand, that was footage taken um, from a position south of the 63rd car source lot looking north into the lot. Would that be roughly accurate to say? Yeah, it'd be uh, right around that area, looking northbound. And does that uh, show the uh, shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum? Yes. Okay. I would move Exhibit 73 into evidence. Detective, this drone footage that we just showed the jury, the version that we showed the jury, uh, did you and Detective Howard have any uh, versions of that prior to Friday? Not independently. We had, uh, it was something attached to a news segment. So the video existed, but it wasn't in its raw form. That was a news segment on Tucker Carlson on Fox News, if, do you know? That sounds correct. And that uh, aired a couple days after the shootings, right? I believe so. And so ever since then, you've been trying to get a the highest definition version of that video. Is that right? Correct. And now we have it? It appears so. And after we got it on Friday, did you take a look at it? A little bit, yeah. And did you get a chance to look at it uh, at home? A little bit. Okay. Did you uh, able, were you able to, to zoom in and, and look at details of the defendant's actions in that video? Yes. What did you see? So it appears that uh, when the defendant comes around what we've been referring to as the Duramax uh, vehicle, uh, he deliberately, uh, when I say deliberately with caution and intentionally, sets down the, the fire extinguisher and then appears to bring his rifle up and point it in the direction of the Zeminskis. Then what happens? Uh, it's hard to tell based off where it was and based off what I was viewing it on, uh, which was my work phone, so it wasn't the highest def. But it looks like Josh maybe t Joshua Zeminski takes a couple steps towards him, and then uh, at that point uh, he, uh, the defendant starts to run, and then Rosenbaum follows. Does the video also show the shooting, the killing of Mr. Rosenbaum? It does. And when you look at that video, how close does Mr. Rosenbaum appear to be the, to the defendant? This is just going off of me looking at it again on a phone, but uh, not closer than a few feet. Not close enough to touch the defendant. It does not appear so now. Again, to me, I don't see anything of what Assistant DA Binger claims the video to show. And when the video is examined substantively, I don't expect a jury to see anything contrary to self-defense either. And all this from unicorn evidence left one business day ago in the midst of the trial on the prosecutor's doorstep. How amazing is that? Okay, folks, that's all I have for you on this topic tonight. Remember, if you carry a gun so you're hard to kill, that's why I carry a gun so I'm hard to kill. You also owe it to yourself to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Don't forget to join us tomorrow morning for our live coverage of the trial again over at LegalInsurrection.com. Until then, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law Self-Defense. Stay safe.